Hi, everyone. My name is Mihir Wanshu, and I am part of Fantasy Book Critic. And this is part two of the podcast that we had with Philip, uh, you know, last 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 week, so to speak, on the Fantasy Book Critic, uh, uh, Book Critic video interview series. Well, uh, today we are going to do part two of this fascinating discussion that we had about the War Eternal series by Rob J. Hayes. And joining us today is none other than Rob J. Hayes. Uh, a quick update for everybody. This, in as you, as you saw or heard in the or last week's episode, this that discussion which we had was not was they had zero spoilers we didn't spoil anything about the books but this episode will be the exact opposite of that we will be talking about in depth about the characters what rob's thoughts were why he decided to do things a certain way why certain characters popped up so late in the books and it is like we said chock a chock a block full of spoilers so if you haven't read the books please 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 skip this Go ahead and watch the last week's episode and, uh, you know, enjoy this for everybody else. And read has... the books. If you yes. haven't read them, read oh, yeah. the books Please and come read the back books. and watch this. Yes, read, buy, and, you know, then enjoy this episode. So, uh, and also, it's not going to take you long to read the books at all. There are just five of them. So, yeah. you know, you know a few minutes like... work, right? It's already about 800,000 words, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, nothing like Malazan, right? Nothing like Malazan. So, you know, you, you, everybody's <laughs> fine. All right. Philip, uh, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself first, and then we'll get jump on. Yeah, hello everyone. If we've done everything right, this is on my channel. So I'm Philip Magnus, and I talk about books and video games and everything that takes my fancy. And Rob Hayes is one of my absolute favorite fantasy authors, indie, published, doesn't matter. He's one of the best out there. And I have been going crazy talking about his books over the last couple of weeks. And so I thought it would be really fun if we actually brought him in and had a bit of a chat about what is one of the most fun dark fantasy series out there, The War Eternal. So, Rob, please, first off, where did the inspiration for The War Eternal come from? Oh, God. Uh, everywhere, everywhere, all the places in the world. No, um, <laughs> so I... I kind of like, I, I had this idea originally um, that I wanted to have uh, a, a world built around this, this magic system of these, of these sources that people can swallow and they, you know, they, they sit inside the stomach and that's where the sort of like the magic comes from. I, you know, uh, it's, it's a type of magic that I've just not done before where it is literally based on a source <laughs> in this situation. Uh, hey, we can do spoilers in this situation, the crystallized, coffins of gods um so uh, i wanted to base um a magic system around around them and i also wanted to do this this story that was set entirely underground because it's it was a setting i'd never done before i'd only read one book um that that did that did it before and that was uh the fade by chris wooding so i wanted to I wanted to just give this setting a go um and uh, and then as I was sort of like gearing up to it, I just uh, I, I think I may have been inspired a little bit by Dark Crystal. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever watched that, but in Dark Crystal, there's the the Skeksis and the the Ancients, and I'm they are familiar with it. The amazing puppetry of um, I've forgotten his name. It's Jim away. Henson. Jim Henson. Thank you. Um, but the thing about the Skeksis and the, the Ancients is uh, they were originally one being. Uh, each of them was originally one being, and then they were separated into their into two, and and they're sort of linked. When one of them dies, another one dies. And I just thought that was a really cool sort of like um, mechanic, essentially, little concept. So I sort of like I wanted to, wanted to do something with that as well. Um, and and then just sort of like I just thought, ah, as I usually do, I'll start writing it um so i did <laughs> and bits and pieces just kept falling into place here and there and um it's it's really hard for me to talk about where inspiration comes from for a lot of things because sometimes i get inspired about a like a specific point but it's not like i i sort of build the world beforehand over on one big inspiration it's usually because i'm such a pants i sort of like as i'm as i'm writing it i'm like oh that sounds cool i'll pull that idea in oh yeah that one and then you know i get towards book five of a series and i'm like oh shit how do i tie this all together um <laughs> so was the tying together of all these elements and that connects to another question i have prepared 
was the tying together of all of these elements uh, challenging, very challenging indeed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, part of the way that I wrote book one is um, I just kept adding things that I thought were cool. Um, and quite often, because of the way it's told, of Eska telling it from the future, talking about her past, a lot of times I'd just be like, yeah, that sounds cool. I'll, I'll have her say that she did this and then she did this and then she did this. And then it gets towards the later end of her life. And I'm like, oh, shit, she hasn't done half the things that I said she was going to do. Yeah, but um, you you absolutely managed to tie it together very well as if you actually had uh, planned all of it all, all along. And, and I believe that deserves all the props, honestly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, honestly, it's it's a weird thing where my my brain works uh, like Cyrilus. Um, she she loves puzzles. My brain loves puzzles, apparently, because mm -hmm. I love just adding things. And then at some point, my brain sort of starts making the links between them, and, and suddenly it's like, oh wait, that that's almost perfect. <laughs> you know, it's almost like I wrote it to, to yeah, with, with, with sort of like this this connection in mind. Whereas I didn't, I just sort of made the connections afterwards. Uh, yeah, I suppose if you've got like a blank page full of dots and um, you connect them all into a rabbit, you're like, oh look, it was a rabbit all along. <laughs> No, it works perfectly well, and I enjoy the fact that you your brain works the same as Cyrilis, because while I was reading about her, that definitely became the character I um, I got invested in the most, and the one I related to the most. I don't know about you, Mihir, which one was the character you felt was speaking to you most directly? Oh, that's a good question. Well, the funny thing is, I didn't meet, like, I, I was... Eska at first was it like in book one I did not like Eska and Rob knows this like you know in book one was very hard for me because I just could not relate to Eska at all and I was like this this world is intriguing but she's too abrasive like you know there is no like there's very little to, I mean I can I understood why her anger was there but it's very little to for me to like you know connect to her but then from book two onwards it began better but yeah my favorites were also both Kento and Cyrilet from book four for book four is my favorite of the series I like I loved Cyrilet I feel like Rob you could write a like you like a you you could write like a whole different book from both Kento's and Cyrilette's perspectives about the way they see the world and the way they view Eska, just because they're so magnetic characters and we don't really get to see their viewpoint. So that's for me. But Rob, I that, just yep, so go on, read, feel okay. Apologies, but that reminded me that I promised to myself that I would petition Rob to write at some point a book series or at least a book from the point of view of Cyrilette. So Rob, consider yourself petitioned please <laughs> <laughs> ah well I, I don't know we'll see i mean the i'm i'm done with the war eternal to be honest uh are you i, 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 I was, started writing I was very that in 2016 it. um so it was a good six-year project um and uh i i have no intention of of revisiting that world but hey, you never know cyril if uh, she's playing with portals <laughs> that is very true and the reason that she's playing with portals were it made me curious about whether she might be popping up into yes. some other <laughs> world in the future. And the whole way that the War Eternal ends, it does not exactly end on a very, you know, uh, closed note. So it, it does have that element of a series that can spawn another series, if you will, if you ever had the ideas. And I, obviously you don't have any at this point, but it would be cool if one day you return to it. <laughs> it would, if I ever return to the War Eternal, which as I say, I have no plans, it would have to be something like long in the future where uh, things have, have obviously changed a lot with, I mean, at the end of, of of death being in heart, it's literally, oh, look, the, the underworld's there and Esker is, in fact, death. <laughs> Rob, so, I had a quick question about the length of this world because you mentioned, like, you know, the, when we were reading this book, we realized that there's a lot, there's been a lot of cataclysms because of the yin, or is the jinn and the ran keep on fighting with each other. But how truly old is the world? Because this world was already there before the jinn and the ran, you know, were put there or like, or by imprisoned them in the world, in the moons by the maker. So what is a true... Like, what is the true origins of the world, or how old is this world truly? Or where is? Um, very old. Uh, I I don't give things like a, a well a world like that a specific age. Um, 
because I it, that that would tie into sort of like a bit of a creation myth where there would have to be a god that created it, or you'd have to be like, okay, well then there was the Big Bang, and then it was like millions and millions and millions and billions and millions of years in the future. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm I'm no uh, physicist, so I can't deal in time schemes, time scales that that massive. So I I don't have a a specific a specific answer for that. I'm afraid it's uh, the the world is old. Um, it was there before the random the jinn were ever put there, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that, that's about as much as it's really relevant. Yep. Yeah. And so it was a primitive one, though, right? From what from your from what I read from the books, it was a primitive one, and there were there were multiple creatures or there were multiple races, so to speak. But it was still a primitive one, just with forests and lakes and oceans and everything. But it's it's the the presence of the random gene which kind of accelerated the evolution so as to speak because they kind of are the ones who created the humans of this world as as their under things terrans there are no humans yes uh, yes sorry sorry yeah yeah um yeah uh so the there were sentient races uh already on the world the uh Mer and the garn were already sentient so they were never changed by the mm-hmm. rand um but uh, sometime during the, the the first war of the the Rand and the the, the Jin, um, the Rand started changing um, the the sort of like semi sentient uh, races. So the Damned became Terrans, mm-hmm. um, the uh, Ferals, as that's that's all they're known as, uh, became uh, the part. And uh, I cannot actually remember off the top of my head what the Tauren were before they were changed. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because the Tauren went on a big old murdering spree once they gained sentience and wiped out all of their uh, ancestors anyway. Um, Which you have to respect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, they're, they're quite violent, the Tauren, to be honest. So. <laughs> and, and absolutely deadly. Uh, just uh, thinking back on that final epic uh, battle in the fifth book. Yes. But I'm very curious. Let's talk about characters and relationships for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Meher, do you have any questions on that front? Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, how hard was it for you, Rob, like, you know, when you're writing these books, and especially because Cyrilith and Kento are, you know, they're set to debut so late. How hard is it to hold on to them? Or how hard is it to, like, to not? Give us their inputs, or even give like a mention of them. Besides the sneak snippets of like Kento is probably dead, and Cyrilet is the is the girl who changed everything or who ruined the world. How hard was it in that regards? Um, it wasn't really because uh, the way that I wrote the books, I wrote them in a trilogy and then a duology. So while I was writing the trilogy, uh, they were never anything more than sort of like children in my my head. They were sort of babies. Um, they never had specific characters or anything like that, apart from the odd bit of, hey, yeah, sort of broke the world. Um, so it wasn't until I started writing Sins of the Mother that I started actually building them as proper characters. I already had, obviously had a few um, signposts along the way uh, that, that would dictate where I was going with their characters. Um, but there wasn't a lot there before... I started writing Sins of the Mother. So it wasn't too too hard holding back. Um and then really sort of the one of the the fun ones was sort of the the death of Kento um in in book two. That that was the one where I, I wanted to when I was writing book two, I was like, okay, I want it to, to very much feel like Esker believes that Kento is dead. Um but the uh the way it's written, the the audience, the reader would be very much like, but is she though? <laughs> and um, as as uh, speaking for myself, there was the definite expectation that Kento would be coming back after those first three books, and in a big way. Yeah. So when in book four, a character speaks out, "Hello, mother." I think basically was her uh, first entrance into the series, the entrance proper that is, outside of, you know, <laughs> screaming with your first breath. Mm. That moment was for me immediately. Yes, he's finally gone there. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, that's the one and only time uh, Kento calls Eska mother. Um, yes, and, absolutely. 
I, I did consider changing it because she literally never calls her mother because she doesn't think of her mother. But at the same time, it was like, but it was too good to take out. <laughs> no, and it, was, it, it's, it feels... It's that nice little twist. Sort of, um, red herring as well, because obviously the, the chapter ends with Hello Mother and you're like, ah, but wait, is it Cyrilof? Who is mm-hmm. it? it? It works really great because I think it has this very very strong ironic subtone that it that just the line is powerful it's good stuff and the build up as well right because there's a build up of like we're thinking that it's going to be Cyril it's going to be Cyril you know all the talk is obviously all about Cyril 19 chapters if I'm not wrong it leads up to that line and then you you know we suddenly get Kento uh Phil may I ask a question if that's okay by all means Rob you never really let us know how Kento and Cyrilith really felt about Eska. And obviously their emotions are going to be very complicated. Cyrilith has the advantage that she knew Eska all her life. But of course, for the brief 12, 13 years when Eska just, oh, 20 years or so when Eska just up and left. Kento, on the other hand, never really knew Eska, but she somehow in the book, I remember she mentioned that she has memories of her. And then of course, the she was filled in with the Rand, you know, because she truly thinks of the Rand as her mother. In your view, and because we're never really given their POVs, we we get a we get a sense of what they feel, but we never truly understand how or what their emotions are towards Eska. Could you care to reveal about what they, as a writer, that what did you think or how they felt about her? You know, knowing how complicated Eska is and how everyone feels about Eska, like not even like Tamura or Hart have like a clear cut opinion about her. Um, it's yeah, it's it's, it's kind of a hard one to uh, to answer that because it's. Because the 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 story was always through Esker's point of view, I never I never really tried putting myself in the head of the other characters like I would if I was writing from their point of view. Like if if I so when I was writing like the the ties that bind, you know, I was even in book one, I was like I was constantly putting myself, okay, whose whose head am I in this time? I'm in Blackthorn's head or I'm in Jezet's head or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas with this one, it was all very much just focused on. Eska's point of view, um, especially because she's the type of person who kind of doesn't really, it's not that she believes that the world revolves around her, but she will make the world revolve around her. Um, it, it, like yeah, when Cyril calls her out for, you know, you make everything about you, that that is exactly what Eska does. Um, she inserts herself into every situation. So how uh Cyril and Kento really sort of like feel about her well I mean um Kento yeah there's, there's sort of like it's the weird situation where Kento be- sees the the Rand Mesla as her mother um but she she recognizes that Esker is her birth mother and it's that I guess a desire to get to know her um even as she doesn't want to be her child as as sort of like as such but it's it's there's still a desire to get to know her to know where she came from basically um and uh as as for Cyrilef uh Cyrilef loves Eska as a mother um because she is uh it's just um you know Cyrilef is a very complicated child <laughs> and woman <laughs> later in her life um and she doesn't really know how to express herself, um, and a part of that is due to her upbringing with with Eska. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's it was very much uh, the, there is a lot of love both between Eska and Cyril and Cyril and Eska um, because they are the more than Kento was certainly Cyril is Eska's daughter. They are very similar in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's uh, a decent enough answer for you. Yeah, I think one of the most um, powerful moments in the book, and one of those defining moments, both when it comes to the relationship between Eska and Cyrilit, and Eska and Kento, is in book four when uh, we see Eska choose to help Cyrilit over Kento, and to me. The fact that she chooses one daughter the, over the other, and she chooses the daughter she kept over the daughter she actually abandoned, it complicates in the most delicious ways 
that uh, the relationship, that three-way uh, mother-daughter triangle, if you will. It is truly amazing. But my interest also goes towards one of the other key relationships in Eskara's life, and that is the relationship between her and Joseph. I think mm -hmm. it's one of the defining relationships of these books, even as Joseph, he kind of falls to the wayside a little, or rather to the background as the books continue. As the first book starts off, it seems like a very one or uh, one directional relationship with Eska gaining a lot from Joseph and little uh, giving little back. But as the relationship shifts throughout the books, we reach a culmination of that um, relationship, if you will, which complicates things to the point when uh, I'd say it dissenters the relationship. It shows that what we took for granted, the way things between Joseph and Eska were, was very, very complex, very much more complex than we thought with the relation of the Queen of Ice and Fire, that it wasn't her who put the uh, emotional command for Eska to kill herself. Did you have that as an idea from the get-go, or was that a twist you came up with all the way into book five? Um, it was, I can't remember exactly where that, that sort of twist came about, but it was, uh, it, it wasn't there from the get-go for the simple fact. Okay. So, um, when I, when I first wrote it, uh, wrote book one and, and when I was moving into book two, Mihir knows this cause he read the original version of book two, which is terrible. Um, Joseph didn't come back. He was dead. Mm -hmm. I said dead, dead. Um, and it wasn't until I realized that I'd gone so wrong with book two and needed to to rewrite it completely um, that I changed a lot of the things that were going on and, and suddenly things started making more sense in my head and fitting into place better. And one of those was bringing Yosef back, basically making him not dead. Um, and from there on, his part in the story started growing a bit bigger and paralleling um eskers in many ways and intersecting again um so i can't remember exactly where it was but it, the it, it it wasn't it, it wasn't a, a revelation that only occurred in book five um because you, you can see sort of like the seeds that I'd, I'd actually planted um in book one because because uh the way that i wrote the books i wrote the first three books before i released them um, any of them so it gave me the opportunity to go back and add things into book one that uh, weren't originally going to be there um, once I'd sort of like finished book three and one of those things is uh, where you, you sort of like towards the end of book one you see that uh, Eska can't actually decide whether or not her her love for Yosef is real or if it's something that he planted in her mm -hmm. um, after she tried to kill herself um, that first time after and you know then you sort of like as you come to book five you realize oh wait so the, the seeds were already planted there Yosef was actually the one who put that sort of uh, that the call of the void that emotional command to kill herself and then changed his mind at some point um pulled her back from the edge and then you know essentially made, did he make her then love him um you know obviously not romantic love uh but you know that that sort of uh, yeah. love for him did that come from him? So th there's a lot of that emotional manipulation, um, which is it, it's part of the the complexity of their relationship and why Eska just why she's as fucked up as she is. To be honest, <laughs> um, yeah, I think a lot cause... of her character can be you know traced back to those early. Uh, formative experiences if you will and i'm not going to ask you if uh you know either way what the sequence of events is there in terms of whether the love is real or not but i'm going to ask you do you know for yourself how things stand does it matter mm. 
it fair could. enough. <laughs> <laughs> to, Very fair. Like, uh, it's it, it's it's literally a question that that doesn't matter. The what matters is the doubt is there, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and you know that's as far as Esker is concerned. That doubt is why she could never fully trust Yosef, even though she loves him. She can't stop herself from loving him, um, but then she, there'll always be that that suspicion, that doubt, um, which is a, a, a poison to the relationship, basically. Which I think you uh, managed to parallel very well with the relationship in book four, the the kind of love or at least lust she feels for uh, the merchant whose name I'm misplacing right now. But he too, Jamis, thank you. He too manages to manipulate her through emotional magic in what is, uh, it's something that you know as a reader isn't mushing together well with her character and you're just waiting for her to realize what the hell is going on yeah. so it's very well executed there <laughs> thank you um yeah that was uh I, I have to thank my alpha readers for that uh that was originally went a very different sort of way but my alpha readers were just like no nah, this isn't gelling quite right um and it wasn't until uh here and uh uh, my sister Rian and my other alpha readers actually sort of like pointed it out to me that that wasn't quite genuine right that I stopped and looked back at it and went oh I'd already actually put the seeds in it to um to to work the way that it does now that 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 makes sense that's really like aha um I just sort of I hadn't pulled the trigger on it for some reason um, no. well so it... thank you to <laughs> me here and the other alpha readers. it was it was uh, you know it's the others I was just happy with it but that scene didn't work quite as well but yeah i was was just happy with this book too much like i didn't i didn't have any complaints with this book you know rob will know that i will (laughs) otherwise have lots of things to tell him but rob i i do have a quick side question as well you know the duology the the original trilogy only focuses on eska and you know her battles but the duology you know kind of brings forth three incredibly complex women characters you know the first are the two daughters in book four still with and kento but in book five we finally meet lesri and throughout the series Eska badmouths risk Lesri like no end. Like for her, every bad thing in her life which has happened is through Lesri's fault. Like Lesri is the worst person. And of course, Eska just hates her and hates her and says that she hated me from the start. Uh, of course, you know, knowing Eska until then, we kind of realize that that might not be the case. And when we meet Lesri, we, we see that she's an incredibly complex and fascinating woman. And she has a backstory because she kind of implies a little bit of it, like that she kind of hid from the Iron Legion because of a certain thing which had happened to her, like, you know, her half of her face, the powers that were granted to her had kind of ruined her face as well. Did you have a backstory? Like, you obviously, you didn't plan to show her backstory, but did you have a backstory formulated in, in your mind about Lester? Or was it just that, like you said, you know, because you had planted the seeds that you had to come up with something to kind of make make sense of what her conflict with uh, was going to be in book five. I had and bits if I, may I always add to that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Rob, but uh, just because this fits very well with the question, did you at any point uh, feel tempted to actually add Lesre earlier on in the series? Um, so I I was never tempted to add Lesre earlier. Um, I always knew she was going to be. Um, a big part of the 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 finale of the entire series um but i you know she she was certainly never at any point going to be in the the first three books she was only ever going to be in the the, the follow-up two books um and as i was writing since the mother i realized that she just she didn't fit in it basically mm-hmm. um so there, there was there was the possibility that I might have added her in a little bit earlier. Uh, her part was always going to be mostly in Despian Heart, but there was a possibility she might turn up in Sins of the Mother, but she just didn't fit in the the narrative um, because it's a very it's a very sort of tight, fast paced uh, race through the world basically, and it just wouldn't have, she wouldn't have fit in at all. Um, but I did have ideas for her her backstory from uh the point of where where her and Esker's stories divulge basically um it wasn't something that I put too much thought into but I sort of like had the 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 idea that okay 
I wanted her to be the sort of like, yes, she was the queen of ice and fire. How did she get there? And, you know, uh, she, there was, there was a lot of parallels as well with the iron legion, you know, that he experimented on, on all of the children. So he experimented on her. That's part of why she's the, the, the queen of ice and fire. Cause Hey, uh, pyromancy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd never gone into too much detail on any of it. I, I, I left it up in the air uh, most of the details up in the air for a good reason because of the way that i was writing the entire series the more stuff i left up in the air the easier it was to then pull all the pieces together um into something that made sense towards the end whereas if i'd gone into too much detail of them i might find that you know suddenly i had a square peg trying to fit into a round hole and it just wouldn't work um so yeah, little little bits here and there of where what I wanted her story to be like, and you know some of the things she'd have gone through, but nothing nothing set in stone as it were. It kind of works because you know it just builds up the intrigue, and in our minds, how like especially for me, I know I've bugged you about this. Like Leslie was this really fascinating character, and I wanted to always want to know more about her. Like what was her life story? What was her story? Why was she? you know, supposedly hating Eska so much or have a conflict with her. And and of course, how did she escape the Iron Legion? Because Iron Legion, if in, in fact, in book three mentions that he has, she's the one who got away from him, that like he's never been able to trace her. So that kind of proves that she was more than capable of, you know, that Eska and Yosef combined because they could never truly escape his reach. But she was the one who was smart enough and magically powerful enough to escape his reach, build her own empire and stay the hell away from him. So that way, you know, she could do what she wanted. Yeah. Um, well, you know, she uh, she she escaped by um, murdering an entire squad full of uh, soldiers and running away. Um, <laughs> Got to appreciate she, uh, she... a woman who can do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She she left the war before it ended, so that's part of how she escaped. Um, but how she kept ahead of the Iron Legion and managed to build an empire uh, or a kingdom. Uh, well, that's that's another story that I'm not <laughs> going to tell. <laughs> Not only did she build an empire, she built it on a continent full of monsters, giant monsters. It does feel very... Um, there's a series of games called Monster Hunter. You're probably familiar. But uh, it does feel like I was reading something set up in that universe, almost. <laughs> reading uh, <laughs> when when Eska ended up on that continent of, uh, well, Ice and Fire. Rolsh. Yes. Yes. The continent of Rolsh. Yes. I, I, I am uh, a fan of the Monster Hunter games. I'm currently playing Monster Hunter Rise on the Xbox uh, with a friend of mine. In fact, sort of jump on oh, a couple of times a week and go hunt some big monsters. <laughs> they are very fun games. But speaking of monsters, uh, that is uh, masterclass in segues. What <laughs> were the most rewarding antagonistic relationships you got to write for the War Eternal series? Um, the antagonistic relationships. Well, uh, you know, I actually really enjoyed um, Kobe and uh, and Eska. Um, there was there was something a lot of fun um, about writing Kobe's uh, storyline back in uh, the first three books, um, with the fact that they kind of they they were both they both very much loved Silver, mm-hmm. um, and in many ways they both kind of blamed the other one as well as each other. <laughs> For for Sir, uh, for uh, Silver's death, um, so there was a lot of there was a lot of tension between them, and you know there was there was obviously there was never going to be any sort of real reconciliation, um, and yet they had to sort of come together and rely on each other towards the end. Um, so I really enjoyed writing that relationship between them, um, and I would say the Iron Legion as well. But to be honest, uh, one of the things about the Iron Legion was it wasn't his relationship with anybody else that was fun to write. It was just the Iron Legion. Um, the guy was a massive tool. Um, <laughs> but, There's uh, something very horrific about him because despite the fact that this world has gods and monsters and nightmares, he being at once human and also so removed from humanity in just about every way outside of his, you know, his desire to actually live forever as a, as a young man, it, it awakens in you a sort of primal fear of what fucked up things humans can do to each other. Well, yeah. um, 
especially I it's one of the things I wanted to do with him actually I I wanted him to be this sort of like powerful figure that even gods were scared of um and uh and yet he truly believed in what he was doing um mm. and it might not be he was doing it for good reasons but he truly believed it um and it's that sort of that sort of zealous passion which can make uh characters uh quite terrifying there is a lot of john irenicus from Baldur's gate 2 uh ah. in the iron legion um because it, it that was one of the things i'd love Baldur's gate 2 back in the day uh it's got to be what 25 30 years old or something by this point but... I, it, yes absolutely and i don't know if you're as excited about Baldur's gate 3 as i am i've been playing the early access edition of that game since it came out i have i think near nearly 100 hours in it already and that's just the first act it's a lot of fun something to look forward to in august that's that's impressive i mean it, it does still pale in comparison to the Baldur's gate two hours i must have racked up i own that game in something like seven different formats <laughs> it <did so> many <laughs> times. it's ridiculous but um i am excited for Baldur's gate 3 i'm looking forward to playing that uh, but yeah, no, it, it was it was always John Irenicus from uh, from Baldur's Gate Two. There's something just terrifying about that character, and I loved him from the very beginning because yeah, no, it, it's the fact that he's just willing to torture people to to experiment on them to to change them, and yeah, he's also just ridiculously powerful for no particular reason. He just is. Um, yeah. So yeah, there was definitely a lot of a lot of John Irenicus. You know, going back to the sort of like inspirations. Where does it all come from? Yeah, uh, a lot of John Irenicus in, in the Iron Legion. <laughs> Absolutely. And he is definitely one of the most memorable uh, antagonists of the series. The other character, far less human, as, as far from human as you could have probably placed him, is, well, the one they call the Maker. And um, he began as this I in the sky, in, in a rift, looking down. When did he become something more to you? When did you know that he would be an antagonistic presence in the series? Did you just have the eye there for a bit in terms of, you know, cool things I can have in a book? Or was it always going to be uh, fucked up eldritch monstrosity <laughs> from worlds beyond? Um, yeah, so in book one, it was very much just eye in the sky. Hey, that sounds cool. Uh, it wasn't until book two where I started putting, pulling together the pieces and realized that, okay, so where do the Rand and the Jin actually come from? Um, you know, why are they, you know, oh yeah, they're in the moons. Why, or oh, they were in the moons. Why were they trapped in the moons? Who put them there and everything? And that's when the pieces started to come together and I realized that, oh, I already had this giant eye in the sky that I put there. <laughs> I could start using that. So it was it was somewhere in book two that I realized, okay, so the maker is going to be uh, a presence at some point within the books. And I already knew that at that point um, it wasn't going to be book three because I already had my um, sort of like end game for book three. So it was going to have to be the big part or one of the big parts in, in book four or five. Um so yeah, I, I realized in book two that it was going to be this sort of eldritch, you know, eldritch style terror type thing from from the void, basically from beyond. But yeah, uh, in book one, it was just something cool I could put in there. <laughs> is the eldritch thing? Sorry, uh, is the maker the only one of its kind? I know it's heavily implied that it's the only one of its kind in 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 this in its own universe, Rob. But is it truly the only one of its kind? Or are there something more like it out there in different parallel universes? <laughs> there are no parallel universes. There are realms. There are realms. That's true. Because S Cyrilith mentions quite a few of them in book four. Like the one she sees, um, which are references to your other worlds, if I'm not wrong. There is one oh, world. Uh, yes, because... There's one which is mentioned, which I clearly uh, remember, is where they, where she says that I saw a world where they worship the stars, which I believe was a reference to the mortal techniques, because they all, always, you know, worship the stars. There's one world that is mentioned where the, there's a dead rise, which I think is a reference to the first Earth saga. 
And then there's a there's a world which is mentioned which you haven't published yet, but I have read that, so which is why I'm, I'm not commenting on it because it's not something which readers and viewers will know about. But that was that was a clear reference to that. Uh, I don't know if you caught that, Philip. Like there's those those worlds which he mentions. I I am absolutely clueless. <laughs> there's like a there's like a way. I don't line. know what Mahir is talking about. He he's just. This is what comes when I read too much of his books. But there is there's like a, there's a clear couple of lines in you know in Sins of the Mother, which I remember like Cyril talks about like you know that she, that when she portals to like she looks at other walls because she kind of that's how she develops this theory. And there's if you and I don't remember which chapter it is, but there's like a clear reference to a world which she says like you know where the people worship the stars, and there's a clear reference to a world where she says like you know there's a the world where the dead are rising because there's been so much bloodshed, which in my theory is a reference to Rob's first six books, the first third saga, because there's like the, you know, they, everybody just kills each other in, the, in those books and in the mortal techniques worlds where uh, people worship the stars, but technically not the god. I mean, they worship the gods, but they also worship the stars. And so that's, that's just my theory out there about that. It's very weird. This channel is not viable for any of Mihir's, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I am neither confirming <laughs> nor denying his suspicions. So there we go. Perfectly fair. Yeah. Mihir, do you have any questions about the antagonists? Am I missing out on uh, any interesting ones you can bring up? Uh, about the characters, yes. There is one more thing. And I don't know, Rob, you're feel, feel free to, 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 to decline it because I know this is something which is, dear God, he he's a cruel person. I'll say this. Cyrilet's father, because we know who Kento's father is, you know, they they are a parent, but Cyrilet's father, Rob, they're called two different names, Rio in some aspects and Win, and they're mentioned to be having extra teeth. Now, uh, this is again a, something from his first series. In his first series, The First Earth, there is a different sort of beings who live called the Drur, and, and Rob, please correct me if the pronunciation is wrong. They're said to have extra teeth when they smile. They look they look like humans, except when they smile. Because when they smile, there's a vast amount of teeth. And that term, Rio or Win, there's also a character called Rio Win in the first Earth world, who is supposedly so powerful and been locked away. This is just me reading too much of the first Earth, uh, first Earth books. So apologies to all the... Rob, any comments on that? And you're feel free to say, I'm crazy. I have no comment. Okay, that's fair. That's very fair. Well, um, what should we move on to next, Mihir? Maybe the world and uh, besides characters, like just the, the world building and the magic system, if that's okay. Because I know, Rob, you had mentioned like the crystal uh, dead bodies, crystallized dead bodies. So I was just, I was just had a quick question about that. Is that okay, Philip, by the way? By all means. When you start out, like, you know, this kind of seems like a cool concept similar to, you know, what has come before in Mistborn, you know, because again, the same thing, like where they ingest those metals and they, it gives them the powers. You did one step, you you went one step weirder when you made these, <laughs> the things that they ingest, which we don't know until like, you know, book book two or book, into book three, that they're actually the dead, the dead bodies or the remnants of the dead bodies of these gods. When did that click into your head? And does that, does that mean that these, I don't know if in cannibals is the right word, but like, what would be the word like you know when you ingest flesh of other beings sentient beings if there's even a word for that um i don't know if there's a word for it because they i mean they are they are sort of like sentient beings but they're they're not really related to ruby cannibals um mm -hmm. and um it, it, it's kind of a weird thing because the 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 jinn don't have Bodies, bodies as yep. such they, they have their bodies in their own manifestation of them um mm -hmm. it's just same with the rand when they die they leave behind this essentially little crystals which are essentially crystallized magic um so i i don't know i i, I don't know if there would be a, a specific word for um for, for that sort of like ingestion but uh yeah it was uh, again i think it was it started to to really come into my mind in books sort of like two onwards what they were going to be um in, in book one it was very much sort of like as i say uh just just creation just adding things here and there i knew what i wanted the magic system to be in terms of i wanted the my sorcerers to 
um, be attuned to different types of magic, different schools of magic. And each of these schools came with one of these sources, one of these little crystal uh, things that they could swallow, which gave them access to their powers. Um, but it wasn't until book two and I, I'm trying to remember where I put all the revelations, basically. It, it was it was around book two where everything started to, to really click into place. The world started to pull all, all the bits that I'd already put out there started to pull together. Um, I think it was book two where they where Eska discovers that they were they're, they're the 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 corpses of the gods basically the yeah, crystal gods it, it definitely is um and i think it's book three where she discovers that the moons were the jails mm -hmm. for the random and the jinn um and then there's more revelations in book five four and five but yeah it it, it was just the again it was one of those where everything started falling into place in book two but it, it just happened in steps it was like as I was writing book two, oh yeah, this 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 all just clicked and it it, it all pulled together perfectly. And then as as I was writing book three, there were more revelations that I was like, aha, yeah, that just makes sense. And uh, and it it kept happening throughout the entire series. It's such a weird way of writing it, um, in that I honestly had no idea what I was doing for half of the book until I was doing it. Um, and then I just, but it it always felt like that was how it was supposed to be even in my mind like when the when the ideas of it just sort of like came together and it, it was just like of course that makes sense i've already set everything up for it mm -hmm. um and it just kept happening um which so so part of the the reason eska keeps coming across these these revelations <laughs> as the books go on is because i was too <laughs> well as a reader it felt really great because you just were like this seems so planned and you know it's like the revelations are also like you know each book kind of reveals like a certain aspect and fascinating aspect of the world so it felt like this was like you had brilliantly planned this series of like you know okay book one is going to be a revelation of this book two is going to be this book three is this book four is that and so it worked out perfectly but it's even more funny that you know you your mind did the job for you without you knowing it yeah <laughs> i had no idea it i just punched it <laughs> There's a very natural progression of the way the magical system develops very, very much so. I have a question as well in terms of a very specific uh, question about Eska's archmancy and her necromancy. Every time her archmancy gets supercharged, she basically taps into the memories of the jinn or ran that she whose course she has swollen i think it's usually the jinn because they are um connected with archmancy correct but yes. is that is that a byproduct of her only of her archmancy her abilities with uh lightning or is that owed as much to her uh necromantic proficiency um the absorbing the memories uh is that's actually um due to her necromancy it, the the archmancy is basically the uh the delivery method for it a lot of the times yeah. but it's the same way that when she uh uses her her necromancy to unravel a ghost she absorbs some of the memories of that of that ghost um and with with archmancy uh she sometimes absorbs uh, memories of the 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 jinn who's who you know that's who the source that's generating the lightning the archmancy came from or sometimes from the person um essentially shooting the you know the sorcerer using the archmancy source to to fire lightning at her um, like in the it's... big fight in the fifth book when hundreds upon hundreds basically of sorcerers shot exactly. lightning into her or at least dozens it was uh a beautiful moment. I think it's something like seventeen is the exact number of seven, seventeen different sorcerers yeah. shooting her. But then there's an arc, an arc, um, what they call arc biter shooting her as well. Uh, it, it's very much a sort of like, yeah, I'm going super saiyan here. Yeah, um, it, it is a very elegant method of, you know, uh, delivering uh, plot relevant information and just narrative tidbits of what is. A rare occasion away from Eskara's uh, point of view. Yeah, the, there's part of it is I wanted to. 
uh, I wanted to deliver some of the information of um, almost like info dumping, I guess, but uh, of of the Jin and the way that you know the the other worlds was built <clears throat> or created and everything. So each of the memories of the Jin that she absorbs, um, they're very uh, specific memories that that relate to things like okay, this is how. Uh, the other world was created or uh i think there was a timely one um which was about the the final battle between uh the the random machine where they tore open the 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 realm um to to reveal the maker basically um so the maker could find them so each one of those is very tailored to what is happening in the story at the time whereas most of the memories that she absorbs from the the people the other sorcerers uh those are very much ways to um sort of expand upon the world a little bit and make it feel a little more human um because one of the one of the best ways to sort of make a world feel much more real is to have you know sort of like little irrelevant details about characters um because it just makes those characters feel more alive um, so it's one of the things that I wanted to do with those with that sort of like mechanic where she's absorbing memories is to have none of those memories mean anything. They're just they're memories of other people that she's now taking on to herself, essentially, um, especially as a lot of those memories are probably part of why she changes as much as she does throughout the, the series as she's absorbing other memories. And it also explains... Um, book three where she's just has random memories of Yosef. <laughs> I thought it was a widely successful strategy as far as, you know, info dumping uh, goes because it, it at no point does it feel like info dumping. It just makes the world feel deeper. The character is more meaningful. And in that way, I think it's phenomenal work, work really. <laughs> Thank you. That's exactly what I was going for. I'm glad it worked. Absolutely. Now, uh, Mihir, do you have yes, any other questions? I do. Uh, one of Rob, in one of the, uh, you know, in our in our past discussion, you know, both Philip and me were kind of curious about this. Like, you know, the Terrans kind of mimic the humans of our world, and knowing the human psychology of looking for gods, you know, we were both surprised that there was not really an organized religion in this world. Now, there are cults. Philip rightly pointed out that there are cults in this world, and of course, Yosef also starts a cult and it kind of becomes a big successful one. But from your authorial viewpoint, what was the main reason for there not being any organized religion in this world? Because they they talk about the the, 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 the jinn and the ran, but they're, and Eska hates them as gods and she calls them gods, but they're, they are gods, but there's no organized religion around them or anything else. Besides, again, the maker cult, which is only in the desert. But what was what was the, 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 the reasoning behind that in this world? Um, in my mind, I find it very hard to sort of, um, I find it very hard to understand that there would in fact be an organized religion around gods if the gods were real and walking around with us. Um, the reason that organized religion exists is because, you know, these, these gods are these nebulous figures that we can never know. Um, whereas, you know, if, if the gods are walking around with us, that's no longer really a religion. That's more of a, a cult of personality. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just, yeah, it, it it's basically, that, that's a symptom of my own um, understanding of religion and the like. And I, I honestly don't think that if, if you know, I, I, gods were real and they were wandering around, obviously if, if Thor was, was, you know, wandering around outside, like look at the Marvel films, it wouldn't be a, a a a religious sort of like thing where you're like praying and worshiping to him. It would just be a cult person after you were like, hey, that's Thor. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. so I think I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. There's yeah. no place for fate when you can reach out and touch God. Yeah, exactly. Um so yeah, the because the gods are there, mm -hmm. there's no organized religion around them. It's just yeah, people do kind of worship them, I guess, but the worship is a very different thing. It's more just following them around, doing what they're told. Mm -hmm. 
and the gods are capricious in this case like they truly do not care about anybody else's existence or their wills or even their prayers so as to speak uh, besides the nebulous maker who the people just pray but they don't they don't know if that being is ever answering them not caring about them or basically indifferent to them yeah i mean the 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 cult that worships the maker is is literally they're worshiping an apocalypse um oh, yeah because it, it's it's the tar end basically and um mm -hmm. a slight I mean, the 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 cult that Cyrilith kind of half starts around the Maker is is purely do her own gain. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's just complete lies that she's just formulating. Oh yeah, the the wash away the 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 sinful or whatever, and you'll be in charge afterwards. She doesn't believe any of that. She's just doing it, um, telling people what they want to hear so that she, you know they'll do what she wants them to. Um, but the Tar End, they they have. Uh, yeah, they have a bit of a sort of like organized religion, if you will, but it's a cult. Um, and it's fully based around this idea of, yeah, we we open up the, the realm, bring the maker into the world, and it, it scourges everything away. Mirroring Except for us, because we're something. chosen. <laughs> I like that you leave some ambiguities. This is just me being weird about this because I'm 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 I like world building to a to a to a really fascinating degree. Rob, in your mind, did you know how many Jin and Rand? Because they're always supposed to be an equal number. They never are like when one Jin dies, one Rand disappears, or and vice versa. So when the maker deposited them into the moon, in your mind, there was there a specific number of how many Jin and Rand arrived? Or is that just me thinking too much? Thousands of each. Oh wow. Okay. So they there was, there was there was a lot of them when it when they uh when they were first there, but uh they, they killed each other off at quite a rate. And thereby causing newer and newer cataclysms, because when they die, they did and that's why there are there there are so many sources just lying around in OERs because they're littered with the dead bodies of the gods, literally. Yes, exactly. Um and that's why there's there's so many things like the the world is full of ruins and the like because uh, battles between the Rand and the Jin have just laid waste to half the half of a virus um so yes there were originally sort of thousands of each probably less than ten thousand but more than one thousand so Ooh. big range interesting factoid for all those people who are fans of the series because <laughs> you you know this world kind of reminded me a lot of the broken earth uh you know books by nk jemison in the sense like you know because in her in in that series it's also the same thing like you know they're Cataclysms of or cataclysms cause the world to kind of get like you know the the history of the world is kind of hidden with deep beneath. And your fourth book, since the mother, it, there's like a fascinating point when you know that lake, and I'm forgetting what the lake is called. It kind of has basically been drained away. And as they are walking in the mud, they go towards the ruins, and they're surprised to find that this city is bigger, like the city underneath the lake is bigger than what they could have imagined. And it's bigger than the biggest city that they have right now, and it's just incredibly complex. So. There must be so much more to the world, and of course, the city that has, has come, you know, excavates so as to speak with her magically. Like it, it, it also has these more and more catacombs beneath it, and so both Philip and me also felt that there is so much history in this world that you know you could probably write a prequel series if you wanted, and you know that had nothing to do with any of these characters, but just these, you know, another random set of characters. It could be an epic fantasy world, or it could be like an epic fantasy series, or even like a darker fantasy series. Uh, would you ever, maybe in the future, when you have some time? No, <laughs> as I say, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm done with the world of the War of Turtle uh, now. Um, and I think it, it'd be really weird going back to this world and not writing Esker. Mm. Like after spending five books in in Esker's head, uh, and and the entire of this world has always been in Esker's head. I think the idea of going back to this world and not having it be focused around Esco would just be all really weird to me. Um, but uh, no, I, I definitely wanted to give a sense of history, um, both ancient and you know, recent to the world, um, with things like yeah, the Lake Lawn, this, this city beneath the lake. Um, it was once a, a, a thriving metropolis of a city that mm -hmm. was essentially destroyed by this the, the war eternal the, the war between the rand and the jinn um you know it, it, it's the idea that yeah the, there'd have been people living in this city and then one day a bunch of gods decided to fight right above them and it just wrecked the city mm -hmm. um 
pushed it down into the earth and then a lake just drowned it. Um, and the, the idea was that there were many instances of, of that sort of thing happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. So after the 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 humans and the Pa and the Taren were essentially created by the Rand, after they were uplifted um, into the new species, uh, there'd have been a sort of period where kind of like a golden age where you know there were new cities being built with the help of the gods and, mm -hmm. and all of that lot, um, and then it wasn't until. Well, that, that that would sort of like have, have gone for a while, but then obviously the random the jinn started fighting, and suddenly, yeah, the, these these cities that had suddenly grown up and that were thriving, that were peaceful, were suddenly being flattened or just destroyed or just ripped out of existence or whatever. So that leaves a lot of a lot of ruins around the world. And I think Esker says it in 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 book one that you know the world is literally full of ruins, mm -hmm. and it's all due to the war eternal. And that's also what causes such a gap in their history, right? They don't really truly know the history of their world because whenever the history, like for history to be there, civilization has to prosper for people to record history. And maybe that was being done, but every time such a cataclysm would occur, it would wipe out the knowledge. And then, of course, that's why these people in the world of aware, it's a human, so to speak, they have such a fragmented knowledge even of their own world. And parts of the world, different different cities, so to speak, have different, maybe more because even the, uh, the I mean, the the warriors from the desert they mentioned like you know there there's suddenly when the desert sands sand shift they'll find like cities or stuff beneath so even they have like this fragmented knowledge but again nobody has thought of to pool the knowledge and at least find out what happened or they're just too busy dying or surviving so as to speak yeah as far as uh, most of the, the the people in the world are concerned they are only really concerned with the the very recent history so the people on 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 isha um their history only really extends back to uh the where, where there was the hundred uh kingdoms that became 10 that became two that became one that became 100 again mm -hmm. um that that's pretty much as as far as their history is really um concerned and everything else is just ancient to them good point sorry philip i got sidetracked Go ahead no, no, no. Uh, tangents are what this channel runs on. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, I'm thinking perhaps we have held on to Rob for long enough. So maybe one or two last questions among each of us, Mihir. Yeah, yeah. Does that sound good? So if you'd like, take uh, the first one and I will wrap it up. Perfect. Rob. You know, you have mentioned so many things in this world, but, you know, there's pretty, there's pretty much things that you probably had to cut out. You know, what were some interesting, not factoids, but facets of this world, which did not, you know, which appeared in your brain, but did not fit in the story. So you had to just leave it out. And of course, nobody knows except you. Um, Yeah, I mean, the, there were originally more, uh, more of the Lords of Severai. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I think I had nine in mind to begin with. Um. But because I'd not really done anything with them uh, too much before it came to uh, Death's Beating Heart, I sort of like I decided to cut that down. Um, so I was going to have a couple of like titans striding through the world type thing as well. But yeah, it just got to the point where it's was like, uh, I don't think I can really legitimately fill fit them into the world so if i did it would literally be a, oh yeah and then there was dave oh yeah and uh and norbert maroon has already killed him so we don't need to worry about dave um so yeah there, there was there was definitely that where it was like yeah there was, there was definitely going to be more lords of severi but i couldn't really fit them in um and then there's just there's, there's other little things especially with creating the second world with the other world as well as as severi severi and Averis. um there was there, there were other monsters that I was originally gonna sort of like have in, like I was gonna do more with the ghasts, just sort of the ghostly type uh apparition type ones. Um and the, the you know, ghasts and geists and all these different types of monsters, and I just couldn't find time for a lot of them, uh, or couldn't find space for a lot of them in the books. Uh especially where it came to okay, I'm gonna have this big battle in 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 Death's Beat and Heart. I really needed most of the monsters to be the more physical type that could mm -hmm. 
be fought rather than having you know a bunch of horrors flying about that nobody could do anything about because they're just incorporeal nightmares mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty cool stuff thank you for that no yeah so you've mentioned how difficult the second book was to write for you but and how you needed to basically rewrite big chunks of it. But what was the most fun, not only in terms of one of the novels, but perhaps even a favorite scene that was just pure and adulterated fun for you to sit down and get out of the way? I mean, there was quite a few. Uh, I really enjoyed the the really pulse-pounding uh Scenes. So I, I I loved writing the final battle in in Death's Beating Heart, um, which ends up being like over twenty thousand words of just like, okay, mayhem. Uh, that was quite good. Um, I really enjoyed uh, writing Esker's escape from um, John Toro in from Cold Ashes Risen. Um, I, I think in in those sorts of scenes where it's very very immediate very um sort of the, the 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 pace of it is just rushing along and it's all very much in her head i found myself really able just to get into Esker's head and it would just flow um so i i i always enjoyed writing those scenes uh massively so there was yeah the the escape in uh from cold ashes risen uh the moonfall in sins of the mother the the massive final battle in Death's Beat and Heart, those, those scenes where they became so focused in, in Esker's head for me that I just inhabited her brain for a bit. They were, they're almost always my, my, my most fun to write. Um, Cause I'll sort of like, I'll come to after like an evening of uh, afternoon of writing and be like, Oh God, what time is it? <sighs> it absolutely shows. I think because for me too, as a reader, those scenes were just, pure shots of adrenaline yeah i uh that's yeah <laughs> they, they were certainly meant to be there was also the fight against silver in uh the lessons never learned actually um mm -hmm. that was a weird one because that was a really <laughs> okay so the way that it was originally going to be that that scene was actually going to be in book three because there was originally going to be four books and then the, of the original but then the original trilogy was going to be four books but then i cut basically a book out so uh that that was going to be like a big pivotal scene in book three but then i had to sort of like move that into book two so i had the i, I had this idea for that scene in my head um from somewhere towards the end of book one and then i wrote book two and it, it wasn't in the book the first version of book two i scrapped book two completely because it was terrible and then I had to rewrite book two. And then it was that by the time I got to that scene, I was like, okay, I finally get to write this scene where Esker and Silver face off and you know, Esker essentially kills the love of her life. Uh which is obviously a major scene for Esker. It it changes her completely. Um so yeah, that that was that was a scene that it, I wouldn't say it was exactly fun to write or anything, but it was it was one that I'd had in my head for so long. I was happy to finally get it on the page. It definitely resonated emotionally in a very deep way, as did several of the other scenes that you've mentioned. But yeah, um, being in Esker's uh, head for all of those, you really empathize with her throughout. And I think, well, uh, it's a pleasure too, really. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very glad. Uh, very glad you guys both love the book so much. To be honest, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, what has been a lovely conversation when it comes to the War Eternal. I personally could probably stay up for another few hours and just ask you anything off the top of my head. I know that I'm already coming up with new and new questions, but before we wrap up, I actually wanted to ask you just two general things. And the first is, well, a big part of being a writer is being a careful reader. So what are you reading right now? Uh, I'm currently reading uh, The Sapphire Altar, um, mm. which is the uh, uh, book two in um, David Dalglish's latest season, uh, season series. Uh, 
Vagrant so Gods. Bladed Faith. Vagrant Gods, that's it. Yes. I, can, I, I can never remember what the series is called. Um, and uh, I've also recently just got uh, Shadow Casket, um, which is book two in the Dark Wolf, the Le- Legacy by Chris Wooding, um, which I'm chomping at the bit to start uh, reading. Um, and I am listening. I'm listening. Oh, I'm listening to book two as, of something as well. I but I'm all about my book twos. <laughs> uh, I'm listening to uh, the great. Is it the Great Hunt or the Wild Hunt? Uh, book two of the Wheel of Time. Ah, um, I think I've read your impressions of the first on Twitter, somewhat. Mm. But, Man, uh, Ram yeah. just needs a fucking bitch slap. That kid is <laughs> so annoying. Like, oh. <laughs> I've, I've not hated get... the character since so much since cough. cough See, cough. I think I think that might have to do with the fact that when when I read The Wheel of Time, I was twelve, mm-hmm. and so I related very hard to Rand. But I imagine that reading it uh, in your twenties, in your thirties, it's uh, it's a different experience than it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just. <sighs> I, I, I hate it when there's so many things actually I hate about Rand, but the main one at the moment is the number of times he's like, I don't want this power. It's like, oh, shut up. You're the most powerful character in the world. Just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Mm-hmm. I know, I know. I've, I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. I've, like, I've consoled myself with the fact that I'm going to be listening to these books very staggered. Uh, you know, uh, I, I listened to the first one like, what a year and a half ago and now i'm listening to the second one and hopefully it'll be another year and a half before i get on to book three yeah. is is michael kramer the narrator rob or it's no a... i'm listening to the new ones with rosamund pike oh, who plays, oh gotcha. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the elaine elaine no maureen maureen sorry thank Maureen. You. yeah she she plays that in the series um i don't know if she's or they're planning to have her re-narrate all of them but uh those are the ones that I'm listening to, mostly because I did actually check out the sample for uh, the Michael Kramer uh, and Kate Redding ones, mm-hmm. and they just the quality of them didn't seem up to their their usual standards. It's mostly because they're just... they're like very old. They were yeah. recorded in the nineties, so it's, oh, wow. I've listened to several of them, and they're very good readings. But yeah, the quality is purely you can feel its age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I, but, I love them both as narrators. I because I I listen to them with the Brandon Sanderson book, so I was more than happy to listen to them. But yeah, the quality. Yeah, a bit absolutely tough. get that. And my other question is, what are you working on at the moment? What's next from you? Uh well, the, my next release is going to be uh, Spire Climbers, mm-hmm. which is uh, book two of my Titan Hoppers series. That's which I still haven't read. Naughty. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> that that's that's coming in. I think April. I haven't decided fully yet, but it might be April. It might be May. Uh, that's my next release. And what I'm working on at the moment is the Age of the God Eater uh, trilogy, um, and its prequel series, the Annals of the God Eater trilogy. Um, I'm working on them both at the same time, which is my next big chunky epic fantasy, um, which is going to be releasing. The first book is going to be releasing next year, uh, and it's sort of based in a world where, uh, hey, apparently I have a thing as well, people eating magic, because people <laughs> get magic uh, by by eating uh, angels. Um, so they, Yum. They Yum. <laughs> eat angels to steal their immortality and, and, and their, 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 their divinity, basically. I mean, I know I would be doing it if there were any angels around, so I can hardly blame them. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Mir, do you have any last thoughts, questions? No, I was just going to say, uh, I was I was going to ask Mir, you know, what is, what is he writing about? So that just answers my question. And also, uh, if, if, since you mentioned Spire Climbers, yeah, I believe your first book, Titan Hoppers, is in the semifinals of the SPSFC. Mm-hmm. So kudos on that and all the very best. Oh, uh, congratulations. I, I okay. don't know when they're going to be announcing the finals, but I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. Uh, SPSFC, for those who don't know, is this is like the science fiction version of the SP, SPFPO, so or Space Bowl, or I don't know what they call it, but uh, all the best to all the semi finalists. But Rob, I'm, I'm hoping to see what happens with Titan Hoppers. I hope it, it gets into the finals because then I will be the only uh, author to have a final <laughs> a book in the finals for both Spiffbo and Spiffbo. <laughs> 
<laughs> space space fic. Space fic. Um yes. <laughs> Which will be a nice little feather in my cap. Oh yeah, that would be way cool. So cool. Well, fingers crossed. Uh hoping that does Indeed. happen. All right. Yeah. And uh thank you everyone who watched up to this point. Uh thank you, Rob, for joining us. Thank you, Mir, for organizing this. And I hope we can come back together at some point and chat about one of your many other works. Uh, I know I will be many. excited to do it. Well, there are quite a few, and there are getting there are more and more of them as the years go on. So, so I think I'm up to that. eighteen books now across six different series. Mm -hmm. That's that's <laughs> solid. That's massive. Love that. Love that for you. Anyway, thank you for having yeah. me on. Oh, no, no. Thank you so much it again. Was a, it was a pleasure. Yes. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll see you next time. And I'm Philip Magnus. And uh, yeah, like, share this video, or maybe just go read one of Rob's books. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye.